Okay, thank you. So I'm working on the InnoDB storage engine uh, since uh, 2003, I think, and uh, for the past few years uh, we, we have uh, started to use this uh, memory sanitizer tool in our CI environment, starting with uh, MariaDB 10.5. And uh, also this RR debugger is uh, something rather recent, uh, I would say uh, about two or three years ago we started to use that for debugging some tricky cases. So first an introduction, you probably are familiar with the Valgrind tool and its default tool, the memcheck, which is uh, doing two things. Uh, it's uh, keeping track of uh, memory allocations and uh, freeing memory and catching things like uh, using or accessing memory after it has been freed. So th for that it has this concept of A bits or keeping track of addresses which are addressable. And the analogy to that uh, for a compile time instrumentation would be the address sanitizer. The address sanitizer is keeping track of uh, memory allocations and uh, catching memory leaks and uh, using of, of memory after it has been freed or buffer overflows. The other thing that Valgrind does is uh, keeping track of uh, use of uninitialized uh, data. It's allowed to copy uninitialized data between data structures, but uh, as soon as the data is being compared, it must be valid. Or if it's being passed to some system call like uh, write or printf, uh, where printf is not a system call. But uh, anyway, uh, if it's being passed to something that, that will ac actually expose the uninitialized value to the environment, then, then that's an error. And for that, uh, the corresponding compile, uh, compiler-based tool is memory sanitizer. And compared to Valgrind, I think that this uh, compile time instrumentation, instead of doing binary-to-binary uh, -binary translation, is better because it can catch more things. For example, if you have a a buffer overflow between two variables of the same stack frame. You have local variables allocated from, from the stack. Then address sanitizer would insert some, some sentinel uh, data or addresses between them so that it can catch buffer overflow. Valkyrie doesn't have that information. It only knows that this stack frame of this function is, is that, uh, that long and uh, it cannot check overflow within that stack frame. And uh, similarly, uh, stack use after a lexical scope exit. That's, uh, that information is, is, is not available uh, in the executable. If it's question about it, it uh, you use something that is on the stack that has been freed, well, then that's quite catch that. Yes, if it's uh, something that after the function has exited and it has released as a stack, then of course Valkyrie can catch that, but it, it cannot catch uh, things like uh, if within a function you have some several lexical scopes and you are exiting the scope and the data that was allocated from the stack in one scope is being used used afterwards that's something that well I haven't seen it but both GCC and Clang that seems that they if you are lexical scope they never use the different stack frame from those I never seen that in assembler and I actually have problems with BGCC yeah, that uh, if you have lots of variables, even the same name, it will basically allocate duplicates uh, in the, in the, uh, at the beginning of the function. And that's really annoying. Yeah, that, that's uh, true. The, the st stack have frame uh, or the allocation of variables in stack, it's uh, dependent on compiler optimizations and also p partially compiler versions. And one thing that is uh, better than in Valkyrie is accurate diagnostics. Uh, you get to know all the local function, uh, local variable names, which are not available in the executable or in the debug information, not all of it. And one thing that is annoying in Valkyrie is that uh, its V-bit uh, uh, calculation is buggy. If you have some bitwise operations, Valkyrie doesn't know that uh, like, uh, for example, a bitwise OR uh, between undefined and uh, one is de well defined as one. 
Balkan claims that it's undefined or uninitialized. And uh, memory sanitizer is checking more things at, uh, at function boundaries than, than Valkran does, because it simply has more information at, at comp compilation time. And uh, multi-threaded uh, programs work with this compile time instrumentation. In Valkran, it's uh, basically an emulator that is a single threaded. So if you have multiple threads and you are instrumenting an executable un under Valkran, it will run in a single thread and it will do some preemptive multitasking. And if there are race conditions, like one thread is freeing some buffer and the other thread could be using that buffer, it's m much more likely that you will catch that error with address sanitizer th than with Valgrind. And similar for some memory sanitizer uh, errors. So we say, we say that things that Valgrind catches because it happens quite often that Valgrind also catches things for me that memory san sanitizer doesn't work. Well, I haven't seen any example where memory sanitizer doesn't or address sanitizer doesn't uh, catch something that, that is caught by Valkan. I, I would pretty much like to see an example okay, of that. If, uh, next time it happens, I will report it or talk with you. Good. So uh, the other part of my talk is uh, this uh, debugging tool, uh, re re uh, recording and replaying traces. So this RR record is a, is a rather recent tool which uh, is uh, instrumenting system calls and conditional branches. Where it comes into use is uh, if, if you have a, a complex uh, scenario which is failing, like a multi-threaded system or otherwise complex execution that uh, something needs, needs to be prepared first and then many steps later something bad happens. Of course you could manually do this uh, in a debugger and uh, executing the steps and uh, preparing things, but if you make one mistake then you have to start from the scratch. The idea of uh, this uh, RR tool is that the you run your executable or, or your processes, multiple processes under RR record and then it will, if the problem is reproducible there, you, you will get a full trace of everything from the beginning to, to where the bad effects of the bug were observed. So you have the full history available. And this one works very well with any sanitizer compile time option. But it doesn't work at all with Valkyrie. That uh, hyperlink in my, in my slides, uh, you will find the slides on, on the uh, talk page later. That's a link to a RR bug that says that we are not going to support Valgrind. So how does this uh, RR work? Basically it's uh, emulating or wrapping system calls. For example, if you have a read system call that is reading something from a file, it will execute that system call, but it will also record the results of the read and write them to this RR trace file. And similar for a memory mapping a file, it will copy the contents of, of that file range to the trace file, so that on replay, it will just re read the things from the trace file instead of executing those system calls. And uh, another th other thing that it's, uh, uh, it's uh, interfacing with are some performance counters of the processor. There are built-in counters, you may be familiar with the perf tool in Linux. Uh, that, that's the similar or the same interface that, that RR is using. So if you have a conditional branch, that's where RR can trap things. It's not interesting if, if, if you are just uh, r running some deterministic sequential code doing some math, that's going to be the same every time. But if there is a conditional branch, that, that's the interesting point for RR because that's where things can change. And uh, one observation is that if you have a debug instrumented build or an other build option that causes lots of conditional branches to be in your executable, then RR can be really un inefficient. I remember one case, it was a failure that was without this, uh, with these options that I have on the slides, uh, disabling the performance schema and uh, disabling this debug trace, which is uh, adding some information on each function 
uh, enter and exit. If you disable that code, then the test would fail like in less than five seconds. And uh, then I, I thought I will see how long it takes to, to run this test uh, with those options, with, with those conditional branches present. It took more than two hours, or at least one, more than one hour. So I, I could say that there, there is uh, more than 1000 times uh, overhead in some extreme cases. No, not normally, but uh, in some cases it can be. You know that with the, with the debug binary, you can just do skip debug and it never goes into those calls and all of those are ignored. No, I, I'm not aware. I, what I see in the generated code are conditional branches. It, yeah, but the, the, all, the condition, all the code within the bug traces is off in the server and they will never goes into those. Uh, if you run with skip debug. Well, I, I wasn't aware of that option, but uh, I think that if, if you have uh, some conditional branch in every function, exit and enter. One, one if uh, in, in a function is... Uh, yeah, exactly. That one conditional branch the is... The thing is that with, uh, if you have debug on, there's not one, it's basically hundreds. So you get the down the hundreds to one, so that you get very close to this 1000x uh, speed up. But with that option, so you can try. I haven't tried, uh, and I don't remember which case it was that w w was so, so extreme. But uh, I, I don't know if there is a po point to do that because uh, uh, this uh, debug trace is basically uh, basically duplicating what RR does. No, it doesn't. Uh, you, you, with uh, this debug trace, you get a partial trace of uh, which functions get called and which, which functions are returning which values. With RR record, you, you have a the full trace of every execution, everything, including if you are interested in some particular function call, you put a breakpoint to that function and you get the full history. Okay, I, can, I should do a call to describe why R are useless compared to with the bug. Yeah, you can do that. Uh, okay, so the, the context is that something goes wrong, uh, you, you do optimization, and something goes wrong, you see that your your test file is totally have wrong results. You have no clue what is in. What I then do, I run a, a trace with the previous one and the other one, and then you just compare the traces. I immediately see where things go wrong. Yeah, that's uh, what I also do when debugging some things. I get, generate an RR trace of uh, something that works, and then uh, another trace of something that doesn't work. It doesn't need to be a crash, or it doesn't need to be a test failure. It's just different behavior, and you can easily compare behavior if you have traces of, of um, multiple executions. If, if something goes wrong in a function that returns zero instead of uh, or one, it's really possible to do that, find that with RR. With debug, you see it immediately. With RR, you can find anything. You just have to put the appropriate breakpoint. But when you don't know the function, you don't even know where things go wrong. Right. The, the debug will tell you, and this function call something is different. There must be some up observable difference. If something goes wrong, you, you set some data watch point and, and you will find things. I, I will come to that, uh, to one example in my, in my talk. So w w one thing that uh, is a drawback of uh, how RR works is that it's uh, basically single threaded. If it's instrumented, uh, instrumenting a number of uh, multiple processes, or a multi-threaded process, it can do both. It will all only allow one thread to uh, proceed at a time. So it's a bit similar restriction as, as with Valkyrie, that uh, it's uh, using P-trace system call to run one thread at a time. And if there is a race condition that where there are not many system calls being executed by, by these uh, threads or processes, then uh, it can be that uh, under RR record, some failures are completely disappearing. Even if, if without RR, you would get a failure immediately, like uh, less than one second. With RR, you could run for hours and it wouldn't find it. So th this is important for uh, stuff like uh, log-free algorithms. But if, if you are using normal system calls like uh, normal mutex, then there is no issue with that. So uh, for in, InnoDB testing, I think that uh, about one third of, of the runs are done under RR record uh, and two thirds uh, with just core dumps being enabled. And the most interesting failures are of course those for which we get the 
are are replayed traces because then, then we can see the whole picture. We don't have to guess from the bad end state what, what might have hap happened. But some things we have to do that we don't we can't reproduce them with, with RR at all. Uh, so now we are coming to using RR with memory sanitizer. With address sanitizer things are fairly simple because in the output of address sanitizer you will have the exact uh, addresses of this address sanitizer shadow bytes which are basically for each uh, eight application bytes you have one shadow bytes that says that which bytes of, uh, of, of this application byte are uh, addressable or, or whether those bytes have been freed or whatever. Uh, for that, that one debugging is very easy you just uh, do continue of the RR replay trace to the end and then you set the watch point, a data watch point on the shadow byte address that you are interested in and then you reverse continue and th then you will get to the point for example where that memory was freed and then you can see wh what the crashing thread was doing at that point and, and so on. With memory sanitizer this doesn't work because uh, the output doesn't contain uh, the addresses of, of the shadow bytes. Maybe the reason is that uh, it's perfectly valid behavior to copy this uninitialized data around. That, that could be my, my guess. But uh, in any case there is a easy fixed mapping. Uh, like uh, for example on uh, MD64 architecture uh, if you have a data address that begins with the hexadecimal digit uh, 7 then the corresponding shadow byte address would would be beginning with two. So there is this uh, five and a large number of zeros in hexadecimal offset between them. You can also see, see it in the generated code if you if you do look at the disassembly of the function. And uh, sometimes with the memory sanitizer, even if you use this option to track origins, which is enabled in the MariaDB build scripts uh, when you enable memory sanitizer. You may need to set multiple watch points to follow the data flow. If the data is being copied from one place to another one, you may need to go back several steps to find where the, uh, where the actual problem was, like where, where the initialization was missing. That, that, that's a bit challenging, but it's doable. It has to be just need to be careful about it. So here is an example. Until now I think uh, it's not implemented yet but uh, we want to enable the memory sanitizer for non-debug builds. C currently they are being run for debug instrumented builds. So uh, by coincidence when, uh, when I was Checking what happens uh, when we don't use this debug instrumentation and use memory sanitizer alone, we got uh, one test failure and it was complaining about uh, using uninitialized value. This is exactly what the uh, memory sanitizer does. And uh, the output looks a bit like this. I have uh, removed some of the output because uh, it doesn't fit on the slide. But we got a warning that uh, here is the value is being uninitialized and uh, we get the stack trace of, of that use and then we get another stack trace of uh, where the value was stored and then we would also get a third stack trace saying that uh, here the variable was allocated but uh, I, I didn't uh, include that here. So first we run this command mtr dash dash rr and name of the test this is built into the, our test driver very convenient. That will run the MariaDB server under RR record and it will produce a, a trace file which we can then replay using the RR replay command. It could be that in some case that the, the test is uh, restarting the server multiple times like for example there is a crash recovery problem. The server would have been killed by the test and then the subsequent server start would fail or some even further step would fail. In that case you would get multiple stack traces, one for each server execution and you, you could check what, what happened before the server was killed, uh, was it logging the data correctly and, and so on. But in this case it's very simple, we just have one trace and there's a symbolic link, uh, latest trace that is, that is pointing to the uh, last generated trace. So what we can do during RR replay 
we can set some breakpoints in memory sign. I say there are two interesting functions. Uh, this Emson warning with origin no return is the one that will be called in this case because memory sanitizer does know where, where the variable is coming from. There is another function Emson warning no return which uh, doesn't show where, where the value is coming from. So we set breakpoints on those both functions and then we execute the continue command because when, when you execute RR replay, it's basically at the start of the execution. And you need to execute continue to let, let it uh, get further to the interesting point where things start to go wrong. So we continue and then we hit the breakpoint on, on this uh, function that would display the stack traces that we saw on the previous slide, Th this output. And uh, then we go up the call stack. The second call frame is uh, is the interesting one. It's uh, invoking this uh, MySQL file seek wrapper function, which then would uh, cause the warning uh, in some system call. So he here we are invoking a seek on a file descriptor, and the position is being calculated from some local variable, which look like it's uh, it's being initialized properly and then it's uh, divided by a buffer length and multiplied by a block length. So let's look at these uh, two things. Uh, are, are they, which one of them should be the problem? So we have this object info for, for the buffer length. We get the address of, of that object and uh, we replace the initial digit uh, 7 with 2 so that we can see the shadow bytes. And in this case, the buffer length, the shadow bytes are all bits are 0, which means uh, that, that the value is fully initialized. So that's not the problem. And uh, then let's look at this script data. Maybe it's that one. And sure enough, uh, we replace the digit 7 in the address with 2. And then we can see that all other data members except this block length are marked as initialized. So what happened? Maybe I will just make a guess. I will put the data watch point on the shadow byte, shadow bytes of this counter field. And then we will see where the counter field was initialized. And then maybe we can see where we are missing initialization of the block length. Why wouldn't you put a pointer on the block length? Because the block length, uh, I know that uh, the watch point would be fi only fired when, when this value is being created or copied. That's, uh, that that, that uh, I thought it's not interesting because we are looking for something that is missing. We are looking for the missing initialization. So I put the watch point on, on this counter field and then uh, reverse continue. It's executing the trace backwards. We have all, all the steps. It's actually doing something under the hood. It's uh, going to some random point in time and then executing in the forward direction. It's a bit, bit complex, but uh, typically it works. There have been some bugs in RR replay that sometimes when you reverse continue or, or execute backwards, it may miss some breakpoints or watch points. So sometimes you, you actually need to execute from the beginning in the forward direction. In this case, it worked. So the watch point is showing that old value was zero and new value is all bit set in 64 bit. This is, of course, backwards because we are reverse continuing. Actually, the new value is uh, zero. This is initializing the data and the old value is, uh, is all bit set because, uh, because the object was just uh, allocated. So here we have a uh, the location where the crypt data counter is being being uh, initialized. I could also have tried to put a data watch point on the counter field itself. But uh, you know, if I put the data watch point uh, using this watch command on something that is already zero and something is writing another zero on top of it, that watch point will not fire. You would have to use an access watch point and then it then this uh, redundant write would count as a read and then you would see that okay the access watch point is being being fired so th in this case I, I used the 
shadow bite and that that gave me the good result. So let's look uh, at the source code around this. We have the assignment of this counter field uh, at line 177 and in debug instrument it builds we are also initializing this block length field but uh, it was an optimization we don't need to opt uh, initialize this field in non-debug builds except that we do have to initialize it and for some reason Valgrind didn't catch this but the memory sanitizer got catch this immediately. So the fix of this is uh, that we will actually initialize not only the block length but also another field that is uh, next to it. There are two 32-bit fields and then there is this 64-bit counter field. If we initialize all these uh, uh, 128 bits then the compiler can emit an instruction uh, to write 128 bits at a time. That would be the MOV APS instruction on x86 or, or it could uh, emit uh, two 64-bit uh, writes to initialize those three fields. Actually, never think is a C do that. Well, I, I have seen uh, like a, I have seen a segmentation violation because the MOV APS instruction was used for something that was supposed to be aligned, and then the allocation function was was re returning unaligned data. Well, maybe my GCC just old because I'm, it's seven. Yeah, GCC seven. I I don't remember when I last used that. Could could have been maybe six years ago or even longer. Uh, there are some limitations to memory sanitizer. One is that uh, it's only available in Clang and maybe some derivatives like uh, in Mac OS. There is this uh, system compilers derived from Clang. I I don't know if it supports this. And uh, one nasty thing is, is that if you invoke the MariaDB compilation scripts with uh, MSAN, it will do nothing if you are, unless you are using Clang. So it will appear to do an MSAN build, but it's actually not doing anything useful. And uh, one limitation is that uh, if you have any uninstrumented code, then memory sanitizer will assume that any data that, it, uh, that code returns is uninitialized. So you will need to compile any libraries that you are linking to also with memory sanitizer enabled. Only for the C library there are some built-in interceptors in Clang. And uh, for example there was a recent update to GNU libc with some C23 functions. Those are not instrumented in Clang 18. So you will need uh, Clang 19 to be compatible with uh, the C library that is current in, uh, for example, Debian unstable. If you don't uh, uh, compile the libraries with memory sanitizer instrumentation, an alternative would be that uh, you add some wrapper functions that check the inputs and bless the outputs of, of, of the uninstrumented code. And for MariaDB, you can check this uh, MDEV 20. Uh, 377, which contains scripts for building MSAN instrumented libraries and uh, instructions for invoking the tests with MSAN. So, th thank you. Are there any further questions? Uh, also, if you want to use Clang with MSAN, you can also get a, a Docker image from a foundation where everything is uh, ready and you can just do, use it in Docker. Right. Uh, the, uh, Buildbot.mariadb.org is based on Docker images and uh, any developer can download a doc Docker image to reproduce some failure of a particular environment. You don't need to have it. You, you, you will have the, all the tools in, in the Docker image. Uh, it will be the same CPU that you have. You can't do that on the CPUs. Sorry? That's the image from Belia. That, uh, I don't see uh, any reason why not. Uh, of course, the Galera 4 library would have to be built with, uh, with the memory sanitizer instrumentation. I, I, I haven't done that, I haven't tested. Is everybody happy with memory sanitizer here that we have been using a lot of time? 
So are we ready to give applause? Yeah, thank, you. thank you. The Maria DB Foundation is the global contact point for collaboration on MariaDB Server. Our work is made possible thanks to the support of our sponsors.